together. It's good to worship God and be reminded that he holds it all together. We're glad you're joining us, whether you're watching online on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page or our website. We're just glad that you're with us. Uh, and whether you live in the area or you're tuning in from around the country or around the world, we'd love for you to let us know if there's a way we can connect with you uh, and serve you, pray for you in some way. We'd love to get to know you and help you take steps that you might experience God's grace, grow in your faith, and make an impact wherever you are. That's what we're about here at Chapel Street Church. We're glad you're with us. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we, we come to your word and we confess that we really need to hear what it has to say. Sometimes we have uh, our defenses up or we have barriers. We are distracted. And so we're asking you to remove those things that we might hear from you, that you would speak to our minds and to our hearts because we believe what you tell us, that your word is living and active. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in a series called Living Hope on the letter of First Peter. Peter writing to Christians living in uh, Asia Minor and uh, modern-day Turkey, people that are exiles in the Roman world. They're living in, a, in an increasingly uh, hostile culture to the claims of the gospel where they feel marginalized, uh, persecuted, and so on the outside looking in for their faith in Jesus. And he's writing to encourage them on who they are and to prepare them for how to live out their faith in that kind of a culture. And it's remarkably relevant what he has to say for us in our day and age. When I was in high school, uh, I, I played football in high school, and in, in those days are far in the rearview mirror now, but I often reflect on them. And I was thinking about um, uh, a recent Recently, I was thinking about an experience I had when I was a high school football player. I went to Crystal Lake Central High School, and I remember getting prepared to play our crosstown rival, Crystal Lake South, the hated Crystal Lake South Gators. And I remember my coach saying to us, men, we're headed into enemy territory. It was just across town, but it really was, to us, enemy territory. And he said, it's going to be the fight of your lives. You're going to have to fight for four quarters for all that you're worth to win this game. You know, and we bought into that, exactly, Absolutely. And sometimes I think when we come to our Christian life, we think of it as living in enemy territory and we've got to fight. But let me ask you a question. What really should be the posture or the attitude of a Christ follower in the world? What should be our attitude toward the culture in which we live? Is it enemy territory? Sometimes it might feel like that. Are we supposed to dig in and fight for our lives? Or should it be different? The Bible does say that we are in a spiritual battle, but... Not the kind of battle sometimes we think, or the way that sometimes Christians behave. I have a good friend who's shared with me his frustrations and difficulties in this corporate world, his job that he's in. He says that he feels increasingly marginalized by an aggressive and progressive diversity and inclusion agenda that he's not only called to agree with, but to celebrate and to teach. And he says there are things in it that just that violate his Christian conscience, his faith. And he says sometimes he feels marginalized, he feels even mocked for his faith. How should he respond in that situation? Should he just give in, go with the flow? Should he keep his head down and his mouth shut? Should he resist? Should he fight back? Should he protest? Should he just quit and maybe find a job that's uh, where he fits in better, that's more, a, more, a culture that's more comfortable for him? You know, th those are not easy questions to answer, and many of us can relate in different contexts. In our series on 1 Peter, we've been examining what does it look like for us to live out our faith in the world. Just to go back for a minute to 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. In other words, live out your faith in such a way in front of people who are deeply resistant to the gospel, that they might eventually, some of them, actually come to recognize God and to glorify the Lord. They, they'll call you evildoers, yet they'll also see your good deeds. There's both things going on, in other words. So, and we've been looking at how to do this uh, in chapter 2, verse 13, by our humble obedience to the, the authorities of the world. In chapter 2, verse 21, by following the example of Christ, because that's how Jesus lived in the world. In verse 17, by showing honor and respect to all people. In chapter 3, in the beginning part, by submissiveness and service to each other in marriage. All of these things are the way we live out our faith in a world that doesn't get Jesus sometimes. And in this next section, Peter's going to show us how this looks when we live in a culture that actually persecutes us, that where we suffer for the sake of Christ. 
I'm going to read uh, 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12. We're going to work our way through chapter, the end of chapter 3 here, taking it in sections. And as we go, we're going to see five principles of living our faith out in a culture that, that, do, that is antithetical to the gospel. So let's read verses 8 uh, through 12. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Okay, so we're going to work our way through this. Five principles. Here's the first principle. The first principle is it takes a community to live the Christian life. It takes a community. You've heard the phrase, it takes a village. Well, when it comes to our living our faith, it takes a community of, of Christ followers to live the Christian life. It's so common today to hear people say things like, you know, faith is a personal and private matter. In fact, that's what most people think. Find what you believe. Keep it to yourself. But the New Testament repeatedly talks about our faith as a public and communal thing. You actually cannot follow Jesus in a purely personal and private way. This is not to say that your faith is not personal. It's deeply personal. But it's lived out in public. And it's strengthened, nurtured, and grows in community. The New Testament just doesn't doesn't speak about or know anything of a privatized faith, of an individualistic faith. Christian life. Uh, Let's go back and look at verses 8 and 9 for just a minute. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. A couple things just to highlight here and notice. Peter says, finally, all of you, uh, literally, you could translate this to all y'all. <laughs> y'all, meaning it's a, it's a collective you, all of you. It's so, we tend to hear the word you in our culture as individualistic and personal, but that's not how the early church heard it, and that's not how Peter intends it. He's saying all of you collectively, all of you, who? Those who have been redeemed by, by, by the grace of Jesus Christ, those who have been called into his family, those who have been filled with his spirit, all of you, the church, the community of Christ followers in that place, all of you, live this way. Well, what way? Well, he goes through and lists a number of things for us here. First, he says, have unity of mind. Now, this has been said before, but it's key to point out that unity does not mean uniformity. It does not mean that we all think exactly the same, agree on every aspect. That's certainly not true in our church and in my experience in most churches. It doesn't mean that everybody agrees about everything all of the time. Here's what it does mean. It's the same word used in Philippians chapter 2 when the Apostle Paul says, Be like-minded, have the same love, be one in spirit and in purpose. Like-minded, the same love. What love? The love of Christ. Be one in spirit and in purpose, meaning as Christ followers, though we come from different backgrounds, different families of origins, we have different perspectives, different socioeconomic environments, what we share is that we see the world through the lens of the gospel. We have the same love, the love of Jesus. We're one in his spirit and in his purpose in the world. That's what it means to have unity of mind. You know, the Barna Research Group studies Christian trends. Let me just share a couple things in a recent survey they did prior to COVID. 42% of self-identified American Christians say that they believe in absolute moral, they, moral truth. 42%. That's all. That means 58% of Christians don't believe or are not sure about absolute moral truth. Now, 78% say they believe the Bible is authoritative and trustworthy. Wait, what? You should be scratching your head. How can 80% almost of Christians say they believe the Bible is true and reliable, but only less than half say they believe in absolute moral truth? Either they don't know what absolute moral truth means, or they don't know what the Bible says. 
So when Peter says, have unity of mind, the same love of Christ as defined to us in the scriptures and the same purpose as revealed to us in the word of God. Then he says, sympathy and brotherly love, this phrase. It's the word, Greek word phileo, meaning brother, treat each other, love each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Love each other this way. We're called into community to love, not just to be loved. God didn't call you in his family just so that you could feel love. He did that. He loves you perfectly, but he calls you into his family so that you could be loving. In John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new command I give you. Love each other as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. Love each other. So in this Christian community, have the same mind and love and purpose of Christ and love each other deeply, showing sympathy and tender-hearted toward each other and a humble mind. This is crucial for us. We don't approach it thinking, well, I know everything already. Let me tell you what I know. But humility of mind and of spirit. Do you come to the Christian community if you do? I know you're watching this online. But if you show up and you come to community in whatever place or context that is, do you come just to receive love and have your needs met? Or do you come saying, God, who can I love today? Who can I bless today? Whose needs can I meet today? That's what Peter's describing here. He's saying this is, is what you need to live out your faith. And it is the grace of God in this kind of loving, like-minded, humble community that gives us the strength to do what comes next in verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. This verse, if you think about it, is, is shocking. Notice that the standard is not just resisting the urge to pay someone back. That's hard enough for me, if I'm honest. It means it, not just stopping short of seeking revenge or of lashing back. It means to go beyond that. He says, on the contrary, bless. So it's not enough for you to just not lash back at somebody who attacks you, insults you, or wrongs you in some way. The gospel call of the Christian life is to go beyond that and bless them. So what does this mean? Somebody cuts you off in traffic? It's not enough for you just not to tailgate them and honk your horn at them and give them the stare down, but to pray for their blessing. Who does that? Who lives this way? Who can live this way? Uh, frankly, it's, it's hard. We need a community to live this way. We need to be encouraged in our faith to live this way. This is the way of Jesus. This is the way Jesus lived when he hung on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He goes beyond retaliation, just resisting retaliation, to blessing. And so are we called to do the same thing. Peter says, for to this you were called. Look at that. In other words, part of your calling and your purpose as a follower of Jesus in the world is to bless people who don't deserve it. Let me say that again. If you're a follower of Jesus, part of your calling and your purpose as a follower of Jesus is to bless people who don't deserve it, who hurt you even. This brings, us, this brings glory to God and it brings blessings into your own life. And this brings us to the second principle. The blessed life is not what you think it is. The blessed life is not what you think it is. Now, recently, it's, it's, it's died down a little bit, but there was a season under which the hashtag blessed uh, on Instagram and, and social media was just crazy. It was ridiculous. And people use that all the time in ways that I don't think it means what they think it means. And so I found a meme that illustrates that very idea. Hashtag blessed. You keep using that hashtag. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Because in, in, in the American culture, American Christianity, we think of hashtag blessed as, you know, it's, I'm, my, I'm living, it's all good vibes and good things all the time for me. Living my best life. You know, posting pictures on Instagram of like my toes in the sand and a sunset and a hashtag blessed, you know. Or we're always doing, posting things that make our life look like it's perfect and we're blessed because of it. That is not what the New Testament means by the blessing we receive from living this way. Not at all. 
Peter says that you may obtain a blessing, but it's not the blessing that comes uh, financially or circumstantially. Let's look at verses 10 through 12. For whoever desires to love life, let me just pause there. You desire to love life? You, you want to love your life? Who doesn't? And see good days. Who doesn't want to love life and see good days? That's, that's blessed, right? This, this is a description of hashtag blessed. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Next slide. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, who doesn't? Well, here's how, Peter says. Speak the truth. Don't say anything that is false or deceitful. Keep your tongue from speaking evil. Turn away from evil things, even if our culture calls them good. Seek good as defined by the word of God. Seek peace and pursue it. This is how to live the blessed life. Now, Peter here is quoting from Psalm 34. And uh, Psalm 34, uh, it's, it's, there's a, an important parallel here. He's quoting uh, the latter part of Psalm 34, but I'm going to read to you from verses 8 and following, and this might be familiar to some of you in Psalm 34. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The younger lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life? and loves many days that he may see good. Peter's echoing these very words. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Verse 8, he says, Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. That's the blessed life, those who take refuge in God. So the blessing that we receive and seek, the blessed life, is not that people out there in the world always agree with us. They won't. Not that they always like us. They might not. Not that they, al they always come over to our way of seeing things. They may not. The blessing we, we receive is not even financial, circumstantial, uh, occupational, or in this material world. It might not be. The blessing we receive is in the Lord. It's in him, the relationship we have with him, regardless of how people speak about us or view us or see us or understand us, regardless of what hardship we may face. That blessing can't be taken from us. That's what in verse 12, when Peter says, his eyes are on you. His, God's ears, are listening to you. The blessing for you is that God sees. God hears. He's with you. He'll never leave you. That's the blessed life. Okay, let's move on to the next section of chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. This is a fantastic passage. Now, verse 13 probably sounds a little bit like Peter's out of touch with reality. I don't know if you caught that, but Peter says in verse 13, if it's, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for doing good? Well, wait a minute, Peter. Don't people who do good, don't innocent people suffer harm all of the time? Don't we see that on the news almost every day that people who, who aren't, do, are seeking good or at least are innocent are harmed? Yes. Innocent people are harmed all the time in a broken, sinful world. In fact, it can't mean material harm because Jesus himself, who was perfectly innocent and sought the will of the Father perfectly, was harmed physically. 
And then in verse 14, Peter seems to answer the objection that, 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 his, that verse 13 poses. He says, Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. He's talking about what is generally true. It's generally true that if you seek good, it will lead to a peaceful life. It's not always true, but it's generally true. But even more, he's talking about what is ultimately true. For the Christ follower, it's ultimately true that pursuing God and his goodness will ultimately lead to your blessing in him. Peter is really echoing the words of Jesus from Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, where Jesus said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Your reward is great. This brings us to the third principle. Suffering reveals something about Christ in us. Our suffering, of whatever kind, reveals something. It, it brings something out, the truth of our relationship in Christ. This is true, generally speaking, we talk about pain and suffering that is common to our lives. It's, that could be disease, like in the pandemic, loss, grief, discouragement, natural disasters, accidents, just the hard things of life that happen to us. As Christ followers, when we suffer, it reveals something about our faith. Uh, I'll never forget um, Kim McCart, who was on our staff years ago, died of brain cancer after a long, protracted battle. And she suffered greatly, but always with faith and with an undergirding joyfulness and hopefulness, even, as, even toward the end. And at her funeral service, her niece stood up and shared that it was the way her aunt suffered that finally got through to her own heart about the gospel. She said, I had this perfect life. She was like a fitness model. And she said, and I, would, I got sick and uh, missed a, a photo shoot and I felt like my whole life was undone. And here was my aunt who suffered over a course of a couple of years with brain cancer, inoperable brain cancer. And she perished and she died and she never lost her joyful spirit, her faith in Christ. And her niece said, I realized what she had was real and what I had was, was false. And that got through to her. So suffering does reveal something. I, you see it in, in people who have suffered. A quality, a depth, a character of their faith. But here Peter's talking more specifically about the kind of suffering that comes for our faith. Meaning because you're a follower of Jesus. That you're ridiculed, reviled, marginalized, cast aside. Now, it's hard for us to compare our 21st century American life to first century persecution in Rome. I'm not trying to draw a one-to-one -one comparison. But the principle stands when we feel marginalized or in a culture that's hostile to the claims of the gospel. And suffering of whatever kind comes into our lives, it reveals something. You know, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus, he, he gives um, what I think might have been the worst pep talk in history. He's, he's talking to his disciples about what, what he wants for their lives. And here's what he says in verse 16. It won't be on the screen here, but I'll read it for you. Matthew 10 verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What? Jesus says, Jesus is the Messiah, the King, God's deliverer. And he says to his followers, you're going to be like sheep among wolves. Now, I don't know about you, but like when it comes to high school mascots or college mascots, I don't know of any teams that are the lambs or the sheep, right? They're, the, they're wolves, they're eagles, they're lions, they're bears, they're tigers, that kind of thing. Jesus says, you're going to be like the sheep among wolves. Hey, uh, Jesus, I, I don't know if you've paid attention much, but it doesn't usually go very well for sheep when they're out there among the wolves. Like, what are we supposed to do? Like, go get them. You know, like, that's, how's that going to end? Jesus goes on, though, and he says, uh, the latter part of chapter 10, in verses 24 and following, Have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark and say in the light, what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul 
Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And, not, and one of them will not fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, look, God knows, God sees, God cares. He's counted the hairs on your head. He cares deeply for you. Yes, I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves. But don't be deceived. In the end, God wins. And he's your hope. This brings us to what I think may be the most central verse in this whole passage from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Now, here uh, you'll see it on the screen. This, this passage uh, is in the, new inter- the NIV, the New International Version. I read it before in the e- English Standard Version. Here's the reason I put it in NIV. Because though I like the English Standard Version, I think the NIV gets something a little bit better here. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. The ESV says Christ the Lord as holy. But revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. First of all, revering Christ as Lord is crucial. Not just Christ the Lord as holy, which the ESV says, but Christ as your Lord. It means to regard Jesus as supreme above all, as your your chief allegiance of your life, to set him apart above all other loves, above all other allegiances in your life, to elevate Christ in your mind every day, to bring to mind and elevate him as supreme, who he is, what he's done for you, to meditate daily on his grace and his mercy and his faithfulness and his love, and to celebrate then who God is and what he's done for you. That's what it means to revere him as Lord. Do you do this? Do you begin your day with thoughts of Jesus? You should. Meditate on him. Elevate him in your mind. Celebrate his goodness. Do you end your day that way? Peter says, in your hearts, meaning starting in here, revere Christ as Lord. Set him apart as supreme Lord of your life and of all creation. Remind yourself of that. Preach to yourself about who Jesus is. This by the way, is what we're to do. At the end of verse 14, Peter says, don't be afraid of them or be troubled by them, those who would oppose you. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. So what's the antidote to fearfulness or being, having a troubled mind? Revere Christ as Lord. Honor him. Remind yourself of who he is. That's how we live a, a fearless life and a joyful life, Peter's saying. And when you live this way, Honoring Christ as Lord, not repaying evil with evil, blessing those who don't deserve it, seeking peace and pursuing it. When you live this way, Peter says, get ready. Be prepared because something's eventually going to happen. Always be prepared. Like the Boy Scouts, right? The motto, be prepared. To give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope. So many key phrases here. Reason for the hope that you have. Those who ask you is crucial. But do this with gentleness and respect. We'll talk through the the implications of this. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Seek peace and pursue it. Do not repay evil for evil. Bless those who don't deserve it. Live that way, humbly, faithfully. And eventually... Not everyone, and not all the time, people will notice. And some may even ask you, hey, what's that about? Why do you live this way? Tell me about this hope that you have. Peter says, we are, this is the fourth principle, to be ready with a gracious answer for our hope. The word for answer is the Greek word apologia. It's where we get our English word apologetics. It doesn't mean apology like you're sorry. It means a defense or a reasoned response uh, to make a thoughtful case for why you think and live this way. But here's what's crucial. It's an answer to those who ask. It's not, Peter does not say, always be ready to beat people over the head with your superior wisdom. Always be ready to argue with everyone all the time, even those who don't want to hear it. Always be ready to, like, attack people with your, with your logic. He doesn't say that. He says, when people ask about your hope, 
because they see the character of your life, then be ready to talk about it. So here's the question. Why would anyone ask? Why would anyone ask you about your hope? Would they ask you? And if so, what would they ask about? Are you living in such a way? Am I living in such a way? Are we living in such a way that people would see and wonder and ask? Is there anything to ask about? Tell me about your hope. Where does it come from? Why don't you behave like the rest of the world when you're attacked? Why don't you lash back? Why, why, do, why are you being so nice to those people who aren't nice to you? Why do you live that way? Now, I, I gotta just pause here for a minute and say, I don't think Christians are known enough for this. And I'll start with myself. Too often we're known for what we're protesting against, what we're angry about, what we don't like. And don't misunderstand me. There are things in the world that are broken and wrong that we should protest, that we should be against. But are we known for that only? We ought to be known as the kind of people who though we disagree and though someone attacks us, we seek to bless them. We seek to be kind and gracious to them even when they are so ungracious to us. What if the followers of Jesus were known for that in the world? It would be different. People would be asking. And there'd be an opportunity to tell them about the reason for our hope. Now, this doesn't mean you have to answer every critic or be a Bible scholar. But it does mean, can you articulate why you follow Jesus? Can you give a reasoned, articulate answer to why you believe in him? Why you've given your life to him? Now, it's, I've heard people quote this, uh, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Have you heard this quote? It's often attributed to, to St. Francis of Assisi. Here's the problem. As far as we know, St. Francis never said this. It's not in any of his books. Uh, he may have, but it's not recorded for us. And actually, if you think about it, it is impossible to preach the gospel without words. It requires words. Now, our life should be a witness and a testimony that's what Peter's been saying. But that only takes you so far. Eventually, you need to communicate with words who Jesus is, the reason for your hope. There should be a kind of winsome uh, willingness to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about him. He's my everything. I want to share who he is with people. I don't want to shy away and hide that to explain how his death and resurrection has forgiven my sin and has redeemed my life and given me hope beyond this life, not just now, but for all eternity. And my whole identity has been changed because of who he is and what he's done for me. Peter says, not from a defensive posture, not from an argumentative posture, but with gentleness and respect. To those who ask, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you about Jesus. And they might not want to hear it. Now, let's move on to the last part of chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Let me pause for a minute. This is verse 18. And this, this is really the gospel in a nutshell. The reason for our hope is encapsulated right here. For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. This is the heart of the gospel. It's what uh, some scholars call the great exchange. The righteous one, Jesus, for the unrighteous one, you and me. He took our place. He exchanged places with us on the cross. I should have been there, but he was. He suffered in my place that he might bring us to God. And being put to death in the flesh, meaning my old life, I'm dead to myself, he makes us alive in the spirit. That's the gospel. Verse 18 is clear, and it's powerful, and it's beautiful. Verse 19 and 20 are a little bit confusing. Let's read on in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, Peter goes from being crystal clear and soaringly beautiful about the gospel, the great exchange, the substitution of Jesus in your place because he loves you and died for you, to talking about spirits in bondage and the days of Noah and Jesus preaching to them in some weird way. What is he talking about? Martin Luther said of nine, verse 19 and 20, he said, a wonderful text is this and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. <laughs> so if we're left scratching our heads a bit, verse 19 and 20, we're in good company. Now, Three basic views here. Let me just outline them quickly for you, and, and I won't get into detail about them. You can read about them on your own. Number one, that between his death and resurrection, Jesus descended into hell and preached to the spirits of people who died in the flood, the time of Noah. Number two, Jesus preached by his spirit through Noah at that time in Genesis 6 to people who were in bondage, meaning prison of their own sin and rebellion. That the spirit of Christ preached through Noah to those people back then. Three, that after his resurrection, Jesus proclaimed victory over the spirits, evil spirits, that is. He proclaimed that his death and resurrection had conquered them before he ascended into heaven. There's lots written about these three different views. If you want to know my personal view, it's uh, view two with a little bit of view three. Um, but you know what's funny in, about this? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, we'll get there when we get to 2 Peter, Peter has this crazy part where he says, you know, Paul also wrote these letters, and sometimes Paul wrote things that are hard to understand. <laughs> really, Peter? Just Paul? <laughs> Did you not read what you just wrote? Actually, Peter's main point here is not hard to understand, and it's really important for us to grasp. Keep in mind who he's writing to. Peter is writing to people living in exile who feel marginalized on the outside of society, feel like the world is increasingly against them, and he's writing to encourage them in their faith, saying Jesus suffered too. And there was purpose in his suffering. Jesus suffered for the blessing of people who don't deserve it, people like you, people like me. And when you face suffering and persecution in his name, there's purpose in that too. God can use it. God will redeem it. This brings us to the fifth principle. Jesus is our vindication and our victory. Jesus is our vindication and our victory. Let me just ask you, if you're watching this and you're a follower of Jesus, you're a Christian, why? Why are you a Christian? I hope you don't say it's because my parents were. Because God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. You're not a Christian because your parents were. I hope you don't say, well, I was just raised this way. I never had a choice. You do. It comes to a personal point of, of, of surrender for each one of us. I hope you don't say, well, just because all of my friends are, and I kind of like the, the community and fellowship. It's good that your friends are, but that's not the reason you're a Christian. I hope, God forbid, you don't say, I'm a Christian because I'm an American. Those are not the same thing, though there are many who conflate them. What is the reason for your hope, to use Peter's words? It's because of who Jesus is, of his victory on the cross, his vindication in his resurrection. That changes everything. That's my identity. That's my purpose. And that's my hope. That's why. Because he sought me and redeemed me and purchased me, exchanged places with me, changed my identity, identity, gave me hope, brought me into his family, put me into this community of fellow believers who aren't perfect, who struggle, but we encourage each other, we love each other, and we try to see the world through, through his perspective. That's why. Because of who he is and what he did. Period. And that's what the world needs, friends. Peter's writing to these ancient Christians, but he's also writing to the contemporary church. He said, when you're attacked or you feel attacked, don't attack back. Don't revile. Don't repay. Humbly seek peace. Trust God. Honor him. Set him apart in your heart and your mind as Lord of all. Live that way. To bless those who don't deserve it. And when those who are watching see the character of your life, and want to know God gives you an opportunity, tell them about Jesus. 
Tell them about how good he is. Tell them how great he is. Tell them how much he loves you and how much he loves them. That he might become for them what he is for you. Everything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words which we desperately need to hear, which are really so relevant for us, which shouldn't surprise us because you, Jesus, are the living word. And we believe you're speaking to us right now. Right now you're moving and speaking and touching hearts. Not because I have anything wise to say, but because your word is timeless and your gospel is powerful. Oh God, help us by the power of your spirit and the grace of your son to live in this world in such a way that people might see something of your character and goodness in the way that we live, in the way that we do not repay evil for evil, in the way that we honor you and all people, in the way that we seek peace and speak truth, and that those people might be moved to inquire about you, and you would give us the joy and the privilege of sharing who you are and what you've done. We praise you for who you are and for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.